Hi and welcome to my Random Ruminations. So, over the weekend, as I'm sure most of you know, I was actually rather sick. I had a very bad sinus infection that got into my throat, my chest, my ears. Basically everything bar my little finger. And while that meant that I wasn't able to do much work over the weekend, though I did get a little done, I did manage to have a lot of time that I could put to thinking about things, working out future projects, that side of creativity, which made me think about creativity. And it made me think of the five following concepts and ideas about being creative. So, um, yeah, number one. You're always at the beginning. If you're creative, you never, ever leave the beginning. Um, by that I mean this. When you start doing anything creative, it requires a skill. Whether that skill is the ability to write cogently, or draw, paint, uh, scribe, compose, whatever your particular, whatever the field of creativity you're going into, there's always a new skill to learn. Always. And if you ever actually run out of new skills to learn, well, then it's your duty to discover new techniques in order that other people will have more to learn. That, by its nature, means you never stop being at the beginning. You're always at the start of learning something new. You're always at the start of learning a new skill, learning a new way to connect things, to connect different skills together. Uh, for example, I can draw okay I can also carve where's the connection between the two well in order to carve well you have to be able to draw because you have to be able to to some degree plot out what you want to come out of that block of wood or that block of stone now I don't work with stone I have carved with wood before and that was one that something that surprised me when I decided I wanted to learn how to carve well and that was that I needed to transfer drawing to carving. At the time, I wasn't very good at drawing, so I had to learn drawing before I could learn to carve. And you'd think that that would be the end of that, but actually the carving skills have led to being very, and, and the drawing skills for that matter, have led them to be very useful for doing things like making props for things like cosplay. Now, I haven't cosplayed very much, but the skill is transfer. And in a lot of ways, I'm still right at the very beginning where it comes to the skills necessary for good cosplay, making good cosplay equipment. You never stop being at the beginning. You don't have a choice. No matter how hard you try, if you have a creative mind, if you're someone who, to whom creativity comes naturally, you don't have a choice. Your mind, your subconscious, will trip creativity no matter how hard you try not to. For example, I took a full year out of writing about four years ago. It lasted about three weeks. Yeah, I took a full year that lasted three weeks. And the reason it lasted three weeks was every time I sat down on the toilet, which for me is a lot of times per day, my I automatically started thinking about this idea for a webcomic. Like images, characters, storylines, uh, concepts for different organizations within it. I couldn't stop it. It just poured out of me. Then last year I took almost a full year out of working on the webcomic and do you know what poured out? constant ideas for another webcomic and a graphic novel and two more novels. If you're creative, you don't have a choice. You're wired that way and there's no escaping it. Nothing in this world is truly original. There was a point in time where everything was, but that time has long since passed. Virtually everything is derivative. And that's not a bad thing. It's like when people talk about, oh, I don't like stereotypes or archetypes. That's crap. Stereotypes and archetypes exist for a reason. They exist because 
they are a good way of, they are, well, no, a somewhat acceptable way of describing a grouping of a particular type of person. Well, the reason that I say nothing is original is writing, for example, is largely based on stereotypes. You write science fiction for geeks and nerds. You write romances for stay-at-home moms and uh, people in their middle-aged, middle ages, I should middle-aged, middle ages. People from thirty-five onwards. Yes, I'm not counting myself as middle-aged. It's it's it's, it's sad. Uh, there's nothing truly original, but actually, that in a way is an oxymoron. Is actually kind of an oxymoron because in reality, it's not an oxymoron. What the hell am I talking about? It's not entirely true, because while the core concept might not be original, like there's a hundred stories about the wastrel prince who becomes a hero, the way you take that basic story and twist it and mold it to your vision, that's unique. Uh, I'm trying to think what else would... It, Within painting, for example, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of portraits. Now, portraits are not original, but each portrait is itself original because it's a portrait of someone that doesn't exist before you create it. That makes it original. It's the baseline concept isn't original. So when you're creative, when if you're actively creative, if you're someone whose brain is permanently creative, you kind of need to be aware of that. You kind of need to be aware of the fact that, you know, oh, look, that's a light bulb. There's nothing unique about that, except everything in it is unique. The glass, that particular piece of glass that never existed before, metal in that particular shape from this metal has never existed before. The internals are all are all original and unique because uh, those particular materials have probably never been in that shape or form before. It's all about the mould you pour your creativity into. The moulds all exist, but how you decorate what comes out of that mould, that's what makes things original or not. More often than not, not, but that doesn't mean it's bad. This one's been hard for me to learn, very hard, but I've come to realise that it's true. No artist is completely happy with what they produce. There's always some flaw that they see that nobody else does. The fact that you have, but it's the fact that you yourself have created it that makes it right. It may be completely wrong in your eyes, but to the rest of the world, it's your creation. You created it that way for a reason. The reason may be that you're lacking somewhat in the skill to pull it off, but that is still a legitimate reason. It's, it's a difficult thing to wrap your head around. And in a way, it's not a great thing to wrap your head around because it, might, it can stop you from driving for perfection. But in another way, it's a great thing because it stops you driving for perfection. Perfection is impossible. It does not exist, not in this world. It's not... It's not, it's not possible to achieve true, true perfection. So, the fact that you are always going to have flaws in your works, it's something you just have to learn to accept. Again, to go back to my webcomic, all of my characters tend to have quite long noses. And initially, I thought that it was a terrible flaw. It made me feel awful about my artwork. It made me feel wrong about my artwork and that it was bad looking and that it didn't work and that other people were going to go mad over it. That, you know, ew, how, you know, God, it's so out of proportion. But it wasn't. What I didn't realize for the longest time was I was drawing people's faces actually the way I see people's faces. Until I stopped and I took a full day and I went to a shopping centre of all places and I just sat down and watched people for an hour and then two and then three and then I went to the movies. 
but watching people, I actually, something clicked inside my head and I went, oh, hang on. Yeah, actually, I see people's noses as being much, much longer than maybe they are in proportion to their faces. I don't know why I see them that way, but I do. So when I'm drawing, I am reproducing the way I see other people's faces. Is it a bad thing? No. It's how I perceive the world, and that's the point of art. That's the point of creativity. Now, I'm not saying that it's the point of factual stuff, like write, making documentaries, writing factual articles, things like that. No, in those situations you are meant to be at least portraying as much as possible the reality of the situation. But when you're drawing or painting, when you're writing, you're trying to let other people experience the world as you perceive it. By definition, that means that whatever way you do it is right. It's just right. It may be difficult to understand that, but once you actually get that to click inside your head, that's the moment you actually realize that you've gone from being just creative to being artistic. Artistic is trying to share your perception of the world with everybody else. I'm 36 years age, 36 years of age, not age, girl. And I've always felt like I'm running towards something, I'm rushing towards something. But in recent years, I've actually realized I have nothing but time. I have so much time, I don't need to rush. Even if I only am an active creative person, until retirement age, which is 31 years away from me, probably actually 33 years, because I think it's going to end up being at 69 by the time I reach it. That's 33 years. That's three decades and three years. Think about that. I have time. If I only produce one significant work per year, that's 33 significant works in my lifetime. And significance doesn't mean that they take the art world by storm or they get published. It just means important to me. I have time. So do you. If you want to be an, an author, but you don't feel you have the skills, you have time to go and get those skills. If you want to paint the great pastoral image, you have time. You have time to go and get those skills. You have time to find someone to teach you, to learn, to teach yourself. This is one of the reasons why, even though my webcomic has fallen to one side in the last few months because my laptop broke and that screen is almost impossible to use with my drawing programs, even with that, I'm okay with it. I know when I get back to drawing Acid Girl, it's going to be better for the time away. It's going to be better because I haven't stopped drawing. I've stopped doing the digitizing work with my computer, which will be starting again really soon. In a few weeks' time, I'm going to be buying that control board for my screen, and it's going to be mounted up there and again on an arm, and it's going, to, it's going to be badass. But that's besides the point. The point is, I have time. Acid Girl is a huge story. There's no getting away from how big a story it is. The tiny little bit I've shared with the world so far is nothing. So, I know it's going to take me years to tell. And I'm fine with that as well. And that, that fact that it is going to take years for me to tell is the reason why I'm okay taking this time out now. Because it's giving me the opportunity to find new ways of doing things that work better for me. There's lots of aspects of drawing that don't work for me. I don't really use colour because I don't see colour... Well, it's not that I don't see it properly, it's that it doesn't make much sense to me. It's really hard to explain how I see colour. It's complicated. But because of that, I, in order to make what I do pop, I have to find other ways of working with imagery. 
This is giving me the time to do that. I have time. The I have a two novel story that I want to tell based around somewhat around Greek myth mythology and that which goes back to there are no original ideas, no truly original base ideas. But while I did start it three years ago, I stopped after writing two chapters because I knew I wasn't ready to write it. I knew that to do what I wanted to do with it, I needed to learn an awful lot more about aspects of Greek mythology that I've never actually gone into in detail. And I needed to learn more about formatting written literature so that it's easier to understand the inner dialogue versus the outer dialogue. You always have time. Always. So, while I'm not saying wait until your deathbed to do something, if it's because you want a new skill, wait and get that skill. It's worth it. But don't wait to get the skill. Get out there today, find someone to teach you, learn that skill. Bonus point. If you are actively creative, if every day of your life you are constantly making some making something or drawing something or creating something for other people's enjoyment or even just for your own you are an artist but there's more to it than that i think the step that meg takes you from beyond being beyond being simply someone who's creative to being someone someone who's artistic is the urge to show other people how you yourself see the world to help people to view other people events places through your eyes and to learn how to speak about those events people and places with your words whether those words are the strokes the strokes of a paintbrush or strokes of a keypad it doesn't matter which if you're creative if your creativity is aimed around in helping people to see the world in a different way, you're an artist. And by the world, I'm clumping everything together. Not just visual, but also things like how you perceive things like bravery, heroism, honour, dishonesty, dishonour how it feels to be rained on, how it feels for our heart to be broken, how it feels to create, how it feels to be a mother but never have children. There's so many aspects to being human and there's so many aspects to living in this world. Nobody can ever experience all of them. And that's what I think makes artists artists. They are people who are unconsciously to a degree and unwillingly sometimes to a degree there are people who are driven to share their vision of the world and help other people expand their comprehension and experience of life the world and everything that's what it is to be an artist and if you are actively creative to share and if you're actively creative to share how you feel about things and how you perceive things, then you are an artist. Now, I will say that there is a difference between a professional artist, a aspiring artist and a uh, amateur artist. There are significant differences and I'm sorry, but you make a living does, does not necessarily make you a professional. Let's face it, most of the greatest artists in history barely ever made livings. Certainly the ones that we know. I mean, if you think about it, Vincent van Gogh basically lived in poverty. Now, I don't particularly like van Gogh's artwork. It doesn't speak to me. But he is considered one of the greats. He essentially lived in poverty. And he would be considered a professional artist. For me, professionalism, when it comes to the creative world and artistry, is all to do with doing it in a way that is professional by which I mean you set aside a time 
to set aside time to be an artist. You pursue it in a way that you do hope and intend one day for it to be your bread and butter. That makes you a professional, in my eyes. It's a way of pursuing it. For an am to me, an amateur is someone who does it for fun, does it for purely for their own enjoyment, who does it as a time filler while they're waiting for their real life to catch up. An aspiring artist, well, actually, any artist is an aspiring artist and always will be an aspiring artist because it all goes back to point one. You're always at the beginning. You'll never stop being aspiring. And you're probably never actually going to feel like you've made it or that you're anything important or you're anything special or anything you create has worth. I know I don't. But my partner and my friends keep telling me that what I create has worth. Does that make me an artist? I don't know. I would always hesitate to use the word artist to describe myself. I call, consider myself a creative person. That's something I haven't figured out yet. But anyway. I'm going to go and, uh, I don't know, do something creative. <laughs> Love you all. Bye.